Tonight's presentation, Tear Down Needed, question mark. Our presenter, Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications, um, certified flight instructor certificate holder, A&P mechanic uh, certificate holder with the inspection authorization, 2008 Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and an EAA member. Mike, thanks a lot for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control the presentation over to you. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Nice to have 600 of my best friends <laughs> with me. And uh, let me see if I can uh, get my screen up so that you can see it. <clears throat> As uh, Tim said, the, tonight we're going to talk about question marks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, tear down needed. This is um, one of my missions in in life is to uh, is to uh, prevent uh, premature aircraft engine euthanasia whenever I can, and uh, uh, so I, I I get a lot of uh, of people contacting me saying my my mechanic says my engine needs to be torn down. Does it does you know, is there? Can you help? And uh, so I thought I'd tell you a couple of stories. Some of them are easy. Some of them are hard. Sometimes I get to save engines. Sometimes they can't be saved. But uh, it's it's always <clears throat> interesting. And I I just kind of want to take you through the thought process that that goes along with some of these things. So uh, we'll go through a, a a few true to life stories of things that happened in the last few months. Um, these are constantly happening. Um, so the first one I'll tell you about it's it's you know it's a little humorous in a way, but it it was wasn't humorous to to the aircraft owner at the time. It was a a vintage a Mooney, is powered by a, I guess a Lycoming IO three sixty engine. Um, fellow is a, a was a military pilot and uh, had a lot lot of time and. In military jets, but was kind of a newbie when it came to general aviation. And he was, uh, he, he flew his Mooney out to a uh, place in uh, an airport in the panhandle of Florida um, near a, <clears throat> a big um, Air Force base where he was there on some kind of business. I don't know what kind of business. I think he probably could have told me, but then he would have had to shoot me. But at any rate, he, uh, he he flies to north to the uh, Florida Panhandle. That does whatever military pilots do in the Florida Panhandle that they can't tell you about, all in restricted airspace. And then he goes back and uh, to fly the airplane home. I think he's based in Mississippi, if I recall correctly, and uh, couldn't get the engine started. So um, he. he calls me or I contacted me. I forget how he contacted me, but he asked me whether whether I could help. He said that he was a very experienced military pilot, first time aircraft owner, and um, couldn't get the engine started, took it to the shop there in the Panhandle of Florida, who quickly identified the problem as being uh, with the left magneto. And uh, this particular engine <clears throat> starts on only the left magneto, it, it, it has an impulse coupling and the right magneto is, is uh, does not participate in the starting process. And when the shop took a look at the left magneto, it discovered that the left magneto was, was pretty much a basket case. The, the, uh, the, the, the case of the magneto had cracked and so there wasn't any way to save it. Um, so the shop proposed that they better order a new magneto. It was a, a slick um, 4300 series mag, and the owner approved that. Um, and he says, now they're telling me the engine needs to be torn down. It's nowhere close to TBO, and I really can't afford to overhaul it right now, but they're saying they need to tear down this engine. Well, why would they need to tear down the engine because of a bad magneto that didn't make a lot of sense so i asked him a couple of questions and turns out what they told him is when they're when they were removing this this damaged magneto that had a split case and stuff that they discovered that two of the 
balls in the ball bearing uh, at the drive end of the Magneto's drive shaft, two of these balls were missing. And so they presumed that they must have fallen into the engine because there's probably no other place they could have gone. And so the Magneto, the, the, the mechanic basically said, we're gonna have to tear down the engine and find out where these two missing in action ball bearings were. Well, this is a pretty typical uh, mechanic reaction and, you know, there's two missing ball bearings and, and, and they must have fallen into the engine and what are we gonna do? Uh, I, I wasn't buying this. Uh, uh, you know, I deal with mechanics all the time that are pretty much spring loaded to tear down the engine anytime something funny happens. So I said to the owner, let's let's think a little bit, bit about this. First of all, I said, you know, when did these balls go missing? Did they did, did they go missing when the engine was running or did it happen while the, like the, the, the mechanic was removing the magneto, which seemed to me like would probably happen. The owner said he wasn't sure, but he said the engine seemed to be running just fine during his flight to Florida, and then it wouldn't start uh, when he went to go home, so it it never ran after that. So I, I, I said, look, you know, if these two bearing balls fell into the engine while the A&P was removing the mag, which is what I kind of suspected probably happened, it seems to me it wouldn't be any big deal, because you know what's going to happen to these balls they're they're, they're either going to come to the rest at the bottom of the engine accessory case where, where they're not going to do any mischief or you know maybe if they got really lucky they'd fall all the way into the engine's oil sump where they would sit there and not do any mischief so either way these two missing balls would be out of harm's way and they weren't good they weren't going to do anything bad at the engine and so what's what's the problem with leaving them there so the owner says, well, what, you know, what if I get sucked into the oil pump or something? And I said, well, I, you know, that can't happen because uh, engines uh, have a suction screen to protect the oil pump from ingesting anything that has serial numbers on it. And for Lycomings, it's very convenient. It's a removable suction screen. You're actually supposed to inspect it on a regular basis. Continental's the suction screen is not removable, and so it's very hard to inspect unless you stick a bore scope up through the, the oil drain plug or something. But Lycoming suction screens are very convenient and they're they're easy to get at, and and they basically are designed to um, to you know prevent anything larger than about one millimeter in diameter from uh, getting into the oil pump and and possibly damaging the oil pump. And obviously these ball bearings are way bigger than a millimeter in diameter. So I said, there's no way that these bearings could possibly get into the engine oil system and damage the pump or damage anything downstream from the pump. I said, you know, I've, I've, I've seen a whole lot worse things than a couple of bearing balls fall into engines and they didn't do anything bad. I said, you know, the Worst thing would be if something like a shop rag went to the engine. We've seen we've seen a bunch of those uh, that could get wrapped around the suction screen and maybe obstruct the oil flow, but the ball bearings couldn't really do anything. All the ball bearing in the oil sump would be is a harmless stowaway that would sit there until someday when the engine needs overhaul and the overhaul guy would find these bearing balls in the oil sump and he wouldn't think much about it because he's seen a lot worse <laughs> in oil sumps when he tore down engines anyway. So the owner says, well, are, are you saying that there's no risk? Uh, and I said, well, the, the only risk I can think of is if the balls actually fell into the engine while it was running and tangled with the accessory gears on the way, on the way down. So uh, I think it would be a really good idea while this magneto is off to take a close look inside the accessory case, because there's a big hole in the back of it now, and make sure there aren't any chipped teeth or anything like that on, on any of the gears. I said, you know, like make sure that you rotate the prop while you're inspecting to see the entire circumference of all the gears. You know, stick a bore scope in there if necessary to get a good look at everything. But if there aren't any, if there isn't any damage to any of the gears in the accessory case, then then, then I think there basically is no risk. So um, 
So the owner talked to the mechanic. Um, mechanic kind of saw the, saw the logic in that, and he did a careful inspection of the gear train and the accessory case, and said that he didn't find any any damage, any gear teeth or anything. He re he, he received the replacement slick 4300 mag and installed it. I ran up the engine, it started perfectly, and the owner flew home. And it was all good, and the, the engine escaped an unnecessary euthanasia. And then someday somebody's going to open up that engine and discover there's a couple of bearing balls maybe sitting in the sum. We don't even know for sure that two balls fell into the into the sump, but they were just missing in action and the presumption was they fell in there. But the point is that they wouldn't have done any damage. So there wasn't any reason to tear down the engine. And the mechanic wasn't really thinking this through in the, in the way I think of it. My, you know, my thought process is what's the, what's the worst that could happen if you, if you didn't find them? And the answer is there's really no significant downside. <clears throat> So that was the story of, uh, of of the military Mooney, um, and he flew home, and he's he, he's a happy camper. And not long afterwards, I I got a similar call for a cry for help for uh, the owner of a Skylane. Um, it was powered by a 0470 Continental engine. And uh, he says, my 182 is an annual. The IA found one cylinder with 38 over 80 compression. And so with my approval, he pulled the cylinder and that exposed the cam. And he looked, stuck his head in the hole and said, the cam is toast and my 0470 needs to be overhauled or replaced. Can you help me? What should I do? Well, of course, I didn't have the heart to, to tell this owner that he shouldn't have allowed the cylinder to be removed just because it was 38 over 80. We talked about that in the webinar last month that was titled Cylinder Rescue. And, um, and typically, if you have a 38 over 80 cylinder and you do what Continental says, which is go fly the airplane for an hour and then test it again, that the reading will typically come up 10 points and, and, it, and it'll pass the test. But even if it doesn't, you, you look at it with a borescope. If the valve is leaking, you lap the valve. If the rings have a problem, you do a ring flush. But almost certainly that cylinder didn't need to come off, but it did come off. And, you know, he, he didn't ask me about that. He proved the cylinder coming off. And once once you let a mechanic pull a cylinder, he, you know, you sort of open Pandora's box because he's now looking around inside the engine looking for trouble. So at any rate, the mechanics thinks the cam is toast. Um, I refer the owner to uh, the Continental Service document on this subject, which is a, a document called Service Information Directive SID 05-1B, which provides detailed inspection guidelines for Continental camshafts and lifters. And you know, it's it's on the web. You can Google it and pull it up. Um, but it's it's a very well thought through document that that. Uh, I wish more mechanics would kind of pay attention to because it it spells out what the criteria for a cam being unairworthy is. And, and for a cam to be unairworthy, in Continental's words, it says um, what, what makes the cam unairworthy is the presence of indentations or crack-like features in the surface along the cam lobe apex. Apex is like the toe of the cam. The point of highest lift, which have sufficient depth to repeatedly catch the tip of a sharp pick or awl, and anything else is considered acceptable. And the 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 service bulletin has a bunch of pictures in there of of of, of uh, cam lobes and to illustrate what's acceptable and what's not. So here here are two continental cam lobes. The one on the left. Those arrows are pointing to things that clearly are crack-like features on the apex of the cam lobe. The cam lobe is coming apart, and that cam is unairworthy. the The right-hand picture has a picture of a cam with kind of you know typical, where it's got some pitting uh, on the toe of the cam lobe, but but not um, anything significant. And the important thing to understand about these cams is they 
they're case hardened. They, they're, they're, they're a steel forging, which is machined into the right shape with all the cam lobes and stuff. Uh, they used to do it on a, a, a big old cam grinder. Now they do it with a CNC machine. But anyway, after it's after the cam is is completely um, formed, it goes into a case hardening process called carburizing. And it, it basically, the camshaft is stuck in an oven uh, and put in a carbon monoxide um, atmosphere and baked for some number of hours at I don't know 600 degrees or something. And what that does is it creates a very, very hard outer layer uh, on the cam lobes. It's, it's a thin outer hardened layer, about 15 thousandths of an inch thick, that provides very good wear characteristics because it's very hard. Um, the fact it's very hard also means it's very brittle. So they can't, they can't you know, through harden the cam because it, it, it would become very brittle and it might break. So basically the cam is made out of, out of tough material, but it has this very hard outer layer that provides a good wear surface. And as long as you haven't penetrated that outer layer, that, that 15 thousandths or so thick um, carburized outer layer, uh, the, the cam's okay. Um, it, it may have some minor you know, surface issues, but but it's okay. But once you penetrate that 15 thousandths hardened layer and get into the softer inside you know, meat of the cam lobe, the wear will start to accelerate very, very rapidly and it'll start throwing off metal and you'll see metal in the oil filter and stuff. And, and uh, that's when the cam is uh, unairworthy. So uh, the, the left picture has crack-like features on the toe. And as I mentioned, that hardened layer is also fairly brittle. So it, it is capable of developing cracks. And that's what happened to this left cam lobe. So that, that, that cam lobe is pretty much toast. And those crack-like features not only will uh, lead to the, the, to the destruction of that lobe, but will also tear up the lifter really badly uh, every time it comes by, it's like a chisel. Um, but the right-hand lifter is, is acceptable, it's worn. It's got a little, a little minor pitting on it, but but it's okay. And um, you know, a lot of mechanics will look look at a cam lobe and 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 they'll see even you know a small amount of pitting and say you know you know the cam's toast, got to tear down the engine. Now for borderline cases, what SID 05-1B says is let the cam decide. What it actually says is for minor distress. The camshaft may be continued in service and re-examined upon the accumulation of 100 hours operation or 12 months, whichever comes first. So what that really means is that, that, that you throw some new lifters in there and on Continentals, the lifters are very easy to change. You don't have to tear down the engine to change lifters on a Continental, you just throw some new lifters in. Um, I, I typically use lifters from Superior because they're a lot less expensive than the ones from Continental, but they're, Last time I looked, they were like, you know, hundred buck part or something like that. But not, not they're not hugely expensive and they're easy to change. So you put some new lifters in there, and and then the following year you you pull out the lifter and see if the cam tore it up. If the cam tore it up, then the cam is basically saying I'm toast. If the cam didn't tear it up, it, the cam is saying I'm okay. So it's kind of let the cam decide its its fate by giving it a chance. Um, and the important thing to understand about these cam and lifter things, because cam and lifter problems are the primary reason that engines get torn down prematurely, or, or you know, before TBO. And cam problems are, are typically related to intermittent use or disuse where the, the cam develops, you know, corrosion pitting and so on. Um, but, um, the the point is there's there's really no risk in in leaving the cam in service and allowing the, the allowing it to kind of tell you uh, whether it's okay or not by by giving it a chance and taking a look and see what it does with the lifters. So I asked the Skyline owner to email me a high resolution photo of the cam lobe that had his IA snicker in a twist at the cam lobe that was exposed when the cylinder came off, and the cam lobe 
the picture of the camelope that he sent back, you know, it showed some some corrosion pitting, but nothing like crack like features or large indentations that would would clearly have penetrated the carburized layer. So I said, you know, that that looks okay. I, I think what you ought to do is follow the the let the cam vote guidelines in in SID 05-1B and just throw some new lifters in there and um, check them next year and see what see what happens. Um, and the thing that's important to understand is there's really no risk in doing this because nobody ever fell out of the sky because of spalled cam lobe or spalled lifters. The you know the I've seen cams that were worn down to the point where where, where you could hardly tell where the apex of the lobe was because it was so worn off, and the pilot never noticed any difference in the engine. It was running fine. Now that you know, if you put it on a dynamometer, it probably would have lost a little bit of horsepower or probably would have had been slightly rougher than usual because the you know intake valve wasn't wasn't lifting fully open and so the cylinder wasn't breathing quite as well as it should. But the you know the the differences are so subtle that typically nobody even notices it until they, you know, most of the time you either find bunch of metal in the filter and you figure out that it came from the cam or you let a mechanic pull a cylinder stick his head in there and look at it and say uh oh my cam's toast you got to tear the engine down which is what happened in this particular case so i like to tell owners that you know cam and lifter problems are are not safety of flight issues they're safety of wallet issues it's it's very expensive when when, it, when a cam goes bad because there's no way to replace it without tearing down the engine uh, and most of the time when that happens, it, it turns into a major overhaul and it, it winds up costing a lot of money. Um, so at any rate, uh, I urged the owner to print out a copy of SID 05-1B and take it to his IA and go through it with him and, and try to convince him that this CAM deserved 100 hours to, to vote on whether it should be replaced or not. And uh, I was happy to learn that that the IA uh, decided that he was willing to go along with that and signed off the annual as airworthy and was going to pull the lifter next year and see how it fared, which is exactly the right thing to do. So at minimum, the owner got another year uh, that, that where he could you know plan for for an overhaul and plan for the downtime that it would in, in, entail. And by the way, this is a terrible time to, to have to tear down an engine because we've got all these supply chain problems that are, are causing the um, overhauls to take a very, very long time. It used to be that you could, on an overhaul, I could figure on being on the ground for six weeks, but but nowadays it's, you know, it's more like six months because of supply chain problems. And Lycoming was quoting Eight months on on uh, uh, factory rebuilt engines. I think I I just heard somebody say that they're quoting six months now. So maybe things are getting a little better. But the lead time is very very long. This is a horrible time to tear down an engine. So if you could put it off for a year, uh, things ought to be a lot better in a year. And you know and maybe and maybe the lifter won't get torn up and maybe he'll be able to continue to fly. Um, but you know, we 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 want to make these engines last as long as we can, and so we need to try to resist the urge to, to tear them down prematurely. Um, and that that brings me to the the third uh, airplane that I'm going to tell you about. This one was kind of the the, the most difficult of the three. Uh, this was a uh, a a new uh, Cessna Turbo Skylane with a Lycoming TIO 540 in it. Um, and you know, as always, the uh, the email starts out. Please help me. My engine is 300 hours over TBO. That's good. It makes good power. All compressions are in the mid 70s, but it has started making metal. And he says there there are chips in the screen and metal in the filter. And he sent me some some pictures. He says, you know, I really don't want to replace this engine because it's running so well. Um, but but it's making metal, and you know what do I do? And he so he sent me some pictures of, of of ferrous metal chips adhered to a magnet, and it was a it's a non 
it's it's not an inconsequential amount of metal. It's enough metal to get to get your attention. It's not quite at the quarter teaspoon threshold that we're, that Lycoming says triggers a need for a teardown, but it's it's not good. It, uh, it's enough metal to be concerning, and it's ferrous metal. Um, the owner was sufficiently on top of things that he he sent the metal out to aviation laboratories, which is what I would have suggested he do, but he figured out to do it all by himself. And he came back with a report that said the, the chips were alloy steel consistent with AMS 6414 or 6415. And um, so I looked that up and, and explained to him that, that those AMS numbers are uh, low alloy, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, steel, and pretty much the only thing in the engine that's made of, of, of an alloy like that was the cam. So I was almost certain that this metal was coming from one or more cam lobes. Um, and again, we in this case, we can tell without opening up the engine just by analyzing the metal. Uh, very few mechanics do that, but it's, a, it's in, in a case like this, really a good idea because it tells you where the metal's coming from. And in this case, it was almost certain that the metal's coming from the cam. Um, the only good news in this the bad looking picture was that the owner had, had put the airplane on a, on a short oil change interval, which is, was a good idea. And he said the, you know, that the last time he cut open the filter, it, there was ferrous metal in there, but there was considerably less than what there was the previous time. And you know that that's a good that's good news because what we want to see is which way the needle is moving. If the cam is really coming apart, the amount of metal is going to get progressively worse over time. Um, so you know the fact that the quantity of metal seemed to be decreasing was mildly encouraging, but it was it, it certainly did seem like the cam was coming apart. Um, but it, you know, the a cylinder wasn't off, so somebody could actually look at it. And because I don't consider cam distress as a safety of flight issue, I recommended against jumping to any expensive conclusions. And uh, that the engine might need to be torn down, but I wouldn't be in a hurry to tear it down, particularly because this is such a bad time to be tearing down an engine because of all those supply chain problems I was talking about. So again, I, I referred this owner to Lycoming's um, service bulletin. It's called the uh, Mandatory Service Bulletin 480F. And it's titled Metallic Solids Identification After Oil Servicing and Associated Corrective Action. And it's actually a very good service bulletin that, that, that basically gives you a pretty much a cookbook of what to do when you find metal in the filter uh, based on what kind of metal it is, how much of the metal there is and so on. And so, as I said, you know, if you have enough metal, it's like a quarter of a teaspoon of metal and it says, well, you got to tear down the engine. But um, in this case, he didn't have that much metal, but it, it, he had enough metal to indicate that something bad was happening with the cam. And, um, So uh, I said, well, let's let's convince your mechanic that he needs to follow the, the Lycoming guidance to the letter because the Lycoming guidance is is very logical and very measured and not at all knee jerk the way <laughs> a lot of mechanics are when they see metal in the filter. So it says, for example, if 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 a dozen metal flakes are found in the filter. It says fly another 25 hours and recheck the filter, okay, and to determine whether it's getting worse or, or, or bad. He he had more metal than a dozen flakes. Um, so here's what when when we went through that service bulletin and looked at how much metal he had, here's what the service bulletin recommended. It said do a 30 minute ground run and then recheck the filter in the screen. Um, if there isn't metal in the filter in the screen after a 30 minute ground run, fly for two hours and recheck. And if there still isn't any metal, fly for 10 hours and recheck. So again, it's a very measured approach. It says, don't panic, 
you know, give give it a chance. But um, you know, she, and he'd already shortened his oil change interval. He, he was he was doing oil changes at, at ten or fifteen hours because he knew the engine was making metal. So he's kind of doing the appropriate thing. So I recommended that he continue to fly following the you know SB four eighty F, and as long as the quantity of metal seemed to be decreasing to continue and fly it and monitor it. But if it started to be increasing, be prepared to overhaul and replace the engine. Um, I said also there's a possibility, a lot of Lycomings, if you remove the oil filler tube, uh, you can get a bore scope in there and at least look at a couple of cam lobes um, visually. And I thought in his case, it might be worthwhile to do that, to just get a little bit more data uh, before making a decision whether he wanted to tear down the engine or leave it in service. Um, actually, um, I, I got an email from him, him today, <laughs> coincidentally, with, a, with another photo of metal on a magnet. Um, and it was significantly less than the last time. And the last time was significantly less than the time before. So it is possible that 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 he might be able to keep this engine in service for a while. It's it, it, it's the most borderline of the three cases that I'm mentioning to you, and I think uh, you know, especially given that the engine is 300 hours over TBO and it's making ferrous metal, and we know that the metal is coming from the cam, that this engine is not really long for this world. But you know, he might be able to get another year out of it. Um, if if he's cautious and keeps checking, and maybe you know the lead time on replacement engines will be a lot, a lot less by then. So that that's that's what he's doing, and I think it's it's a, it's it's a prudent course of action. Um, as I said, this engine probably is going to meet its maker pretty soon, but you know not this week anyway. So. Those are the, the the three tales I wanted to tell you on this subject about you know how we deal with uh, tear down decisions. Um, we try to take a very cautious, data driven approach, and the manufacturers sometimes give us really good, useful guidance that we can use to justify a cautious approach with mechanics who are you know their instinct is let's tear down the engines making metal. Um, so at this point, um, Tim, we, if you want to, we can open it up for a little Q&A if anybody has any questions. All right, Mark. Uh, has Mark? The first, yeah, Mark oh. has the first question here. <laughs> You're calling me Mark, okay. Yeah. Mark has the first question. You're saying, um, going back to the ball bearing example, what about negative Gs? Doesn't all the unfiltered oil from the sump get splashed around the moving parts in the crankcase when the it, engine it, goes negative? You know, it's funny you should say that because when I was when I was talking to this this owner, this was the Mooney the Mooney owner that was the Air Force pilot. I, I I was joking with him and I said I said you don't plan to do any inverted flight in your movie, do you? Because <laughs> uh -huh. uh, we were we were kind of joking about that, but um, uh, you know, it's it's those things aren't really aren't going to be aren't going to do any harm. They're they're probably going to eventually just sort of get glued to the bottom of the of the oil pan in 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 the sludge that develops down there and just you know sit there and not do any harm for until the engine gets torn down but you 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 wouldn't believe some of the stuff that we find in in oil sumps the ball bearings are one of the most innocuous things you can find in an oil sump Philip was wondering, could you go fishing around with a magnet into the sump? You, you, you might be able to. Um, I, you know, I don't. I I didn't get deep enough into this to to know exactly what the configuration of his sump was and where you could get in with a magnet. You, you know, you might be able to pull a suction screen and, and and stick a magnet in that in that hole. You might be able to fish around with a from the the oil drain port um i mainly i wanted to get the guy home where he could deal with this at his leisure instead of being stuck you know in in, in florida where you know in a strange shop with mechanics that were strangers to him and so on so i i wouldn't be surprised if, if he did go fish around for for it with a magnet but 
Um, but I, I mostly just wanted to get him out of out of his trap position, you know, away from home. William wonders: Can a mechanic declare the plane unairworthy with a lost bearing or their interpretation of a Warren cam, for example? Um, well, it, it depends on the context. If if, if the airplane, if, if if it was like the last example or, or the middle example, maybe where the airplane was in an annual inspection. That means that you've hired an IA to make an airworthiness determination on the aircraft, and um, he can determine that it's airworthy or unairworthy. That's that's his job. Uh, in the case of the Air Force guy the, in the Mooney, um, he didn't bring it into the shop for 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 an inspection. So, um, the, you know, the the mechanic does, isn't 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 being asked to um to weigh in on the airworthiness of the aircraft um there was a i did a, a webinar oh god a couple of years ago that i'm sure is in the archives called a mechanic the mechanic signature mm. which, which sort of bears on this particular subject because mechanics sign off logbook entries and there are two different kinds of logbook entries they sign off there are ones for inspections and there are ones for everything else and uh, a, a, an inspection entry is 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 um, covered by a, a regulation called uh, FAR 4311, and the, in, the the entries for everything else are covered by another reg called 439. And when a mechanic signs a 4311 entry, which he does when he's doing a, an annual inspection or a hundred hour inspection, his signature. Um, represents a statement of airworthiness or unairworthiness. The, the the words right before his signature is, I certify that I have inspected this aircraft in accordance with an annual inspection and have found it in airworthy condition or that, that I've inspected it and given a list of uh, unairworthy items and discrepancies to the to the owner. So one of those entries can be signed off as either airworthy or unairworthy. Normally, they're signed off as airworthy because typically, while the airplane's in annual, the owner approves doing whatever it takes to 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 resolve discrepancies and make it airworthy. But when a mechanic signs off a 439 entry, like for example, you know, re replace right magneto with with slick 4300 serial number such and such. Um, the mechanic's signature on that entry doesn't have anything to do with the airworthiness of the aircraft. It, all it says is that he, the mechanic signature means that the work that was performed was performed in a satisfactory fashion. That's all it means. And uh, so, in, in the case of the air of the Air Force guy, um, that mechanic was was not hired to do an inspection. He was hired to do a repair. And so he doesn't get to weigh in on the airworthiness of the aircraft. All he can do is make an entry that that memorializes the work he did. And now mechanics are, are sometimes are not clear on the distinction, but but the, the two are very very distinct. Once a year, we're required to hire somebody to make an airworthiness determination. The, the rest of the time, they don't. The rest of the time, they just uh, they just fix stuff, and uh, they aren't they aren't entitled to to make an error this determination under uh, in, in that context. Okay, Joseph, we're a little bit off off the subject here, I guess. That's good stuff. Um, Joseph was just wondering, do you need to pull the cylinders to replace lifters on a Continental engine? No, the, the, you don't. You don't have to pull anything except the lifters. You. You you do have to remove the the rocker covers and the rockers and the and the push rods and the push rod housings, and then you can replace the, but but the but the cylinder stays in place. The cylinder doesn't have to come off. Walt's wondering. Well, well, light homings are are different. Light homings you can't replace lifters without splitting the case. Hmm. Walt's wondering are lifters case hardened the same as the camshaft? 
Uh, lifters are, are hardened. I, I don't really know the process. They're made of a different material. They're made out of something called chilled cast iron. Uh, and I know that they're that that they are hardened and hardness tested. Uh, and actually, if you look at a brand new lifter, you'll see a little a little punch mark on the lifter face where they did a Rockwell test on each lifter to make sure that it met the hardness spec. But um, it's a different material. The lifters are made of some of, of a material that's a little bit softer than what the cam is made out of. So that the lifters in a way are, are sacrificial. And frequently, if you catch a problem early enough, the lifter may be torn up, but the cam may still be okay. And that's kind of what that part of the Continental SIDO 5-1B, I guess it is, uh, is about, you know, change the lifter and then give it a hundred hours and see if the cam tears it up. Paul was wondering, uh, you've talked in the past about how hard it is to inspect Lycoming cams. That's why um, he asked a question earlier, which was, um, why not pull the push rod and run a bore scope in? Uh, can the lobe be viewed then? On a Lycoming, you can't, you can't get in there. The, the Lycoming lifters are what are called mushroom lifters, that, that, which is that the the, the the end of the lifter that rides on the cam is much, much larger diameter than the barrel of the lifter that 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 goes through the boss in the case. So it you, you can't you can't pull a lycoming lifter out and you can't stick anything in in the hole. But with continentals, the lifters are what are called barrel style lifters. They're constant diameter. And so they're easy to remove. And once you've removed them, you've got a hole that you can stick a borescope in and take a look at a cam lobe. But Lycomings are, are, are built differently. You can't do that. There's actually only one, there's one exception. There's a, there is one Lycoming engine that was in Skyhawks for a while called the 0320H2BD, I think it is. No, I, uh, I forget, but anyway, they, Lycoming built one engine that had barrel style lifters uh, that were kind of like Continental. And it turned out to be a disaster. So they stopped doing it and they went back to the old ones. Mm -hmm. And of course, now, they, now they've got these roller style tappets in the, in the latest series of engines. Daniel asks, couldn't the mechanic in the case of the ball bearing refuse to sign a maintenance entry by claiming he cannot state he completed the repair correctly since he inadvertently dropped ball bearings into the engine? Yeah, probably. He probably could have given the owner a hard time. And I, I was glad that he didn't. That's always, that's always an issue. That's why we try to um, refer to the man, the engine manufacturer's uh, service bulletins because if if you have a service bulletin, you can usually convince a mechanic to follow it um, because it basically says, well, you know, don't we're, we're not asking you to make the airworthy decision. We're asking you to follow the Lycoming or Continental uh, guidance on 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 whether it's airworthy or not. But the, the the bearing ball thing that was, you know, there was there's no guidance for for dropping bearing balls into engines. I don't know of any service boat that could cover that. So that we just had, I just you know had to make a persuasive argument. David says I don't mind if my engine meets its maker as long as it doesn't make me meet mine. Good point. <laughs> uh huh. What, what is the typical result if you wait? too long and the camshaft meets its maker while in the air with you and your family there there it, there is no that, see that's that's the whole point there, there there's there's no such scenario like like that the cam the whichever cam lobe it is that's in question and and in my experience it's usually an intake cam lobe that that, that goes um the, it it just it just wears down and as it wears down the, the, the there's progressively less lift on the intake valve so the intake valve doesn't quite open 
totally com fully as it should. And so the, the, the cylinder gets a little less air. It, it, it interferes with, with the volumetric efficiency of the cylinder. And if you had some way of monitoring it, you'd probably see that that cylinder was putting out a little less power than, than, its, than its neighbors. But typically, it's such a subtle difference that, that pilots don't even notice. So that, that was my point. Don't, don't think that, that something is ha that happens with cams and lifters can make you fall out of the sky. It doesn't work that way. There, there are things that can make you fall out of the sky. You know, a, a, an exhaust valve failure could make you fall out of the sky, but, but cam and lifter problems aren't like that. They, 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 they don't call it, cause engines to stop. They don't cause engines to lose large amounts of power. It just doesn't work that way. Greg says, I tore my engine down. I'm feeling unwise. Uh, we had bearing metal in the oil filter and screen, so we pulled cylinders. Uh, the number three piston was found to have a crack in the skirt, and the cam was rusted. Should I just replace the piston and let the engine keep going? Uh, it, that, that depends on a lot of things. Um, you know, it's it, it's interesting, but um, there is no regulation that requires uh, an 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 aircraft engine being flown in Part 91 non-commercial service to ever be overhauled. You you don't ever have to overhaul an engine. You you can you can just keep running it and repair it as necessary. Um, uh, and, and there's there's no limit. So typically, what happens is when when an engine gets torn down, you 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 ask if you're smart. What you do is you ask the engine shop to pre prepare a report on what they found dimensionally on on all the stuff when they tore it down, and then you can decide based on what they find whether it whether you want to go ahead and instruct them to do a full overhaul or whether you just want to instruct them to do an IRAN. You know, for example, replace the cam and lifters and and, and leave the cylinders and everything else alone. Uh, because th when they tear down the engine, they'll 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 measure everything. And you'll find out if your cylinders are within service limits and you'll find out whether, you know, whether your bearings look good. Of course, bearings always get change anytime the case is split anyway so that's kind of that that happens in, inevitably the bearings are pretty cheap um but it's it's you know it's uh, another factor about whether you're going to overhaul or just do an iran is whether you plan to keep the airplane or whether you plan to sell it because uh, time since overhaul has has a very direct effect on the resale value of the airplane. So if you're planning to sell the airplane, it, it, it might be worth your while to do the overhaul. But if you're not planning to sell the airplane, then you don't care what the resale value of the airplane is. Um, and so you you know you you it frequently will make sense to do an IRAN if if for example the cylinders are okay, but there's just a problem with the cam. You just say well, okay. Give me a cam transplant, change all the bearing, put it back together. But, the, but when you send the engine off the engine shop, you don't have to decide at that point whether you want to overhaul or not. You can let them do the tear down and prepare the, the inspection report and then decide based on what they tell you they found, whether you want to instruct them to do a full overhaul or not. A few people have asked the question, what about if you have a prop strike? Then is a teardown needed? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the answer is, uh, from, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, the, a teardown is not needed, but there's, there's one caveat. If it's a Continental engine, th there's, there's no airworthiness directive or anything that says you have to tear down the engine after prop strike. And and this is the, the, what I'm talking about right now is apart from whether you should do a teardown. I'm just talking about the requirements. For light coming engines, there's an airworthiness directive that says if you have a prop strike, you have to take some stuff apart. But it doesn't involve splitting the case. The AD requires basically that you pull the accessory case off the back of the engine and that you uh, replace some 
parts having to do with the with the, uh, the 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 crankshaft gear that's at the very rear of the crankshaft as it protrudes into the accessory case. Um, now both continental and Lycoming recommend that you do a full teardown after after a prop strike, and most people do um, because normally it's covered by insurance, so it's it's not a cost issue. And there is sort of a benefit of doing the the teardown is that you you basically get all new bearings and stuff like that as as a result of the teardown. So um, the the engine comes back you know better after the teardown than it was before, and insurance is is picking up the cost normally. But as as far as whether you really need to do that, if you, if you didn't want to, for example, I mean our experience is that that, that I classify prop strikes into two categories, high power prop strikes and low power prop strikes. An awful lot of prop strikes are low power prop strikes. They're, they're, they're prop strikes that occur uh, when the engine is at or near idle. Uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a gear up landing is normally a low power prop strike unless the pilot is silly enough to throttle up and try to go around, in which case he turns it into a high, high power prop strike. A, pro, a prop strike where you start the engine and forgot to take off the tow bar is a low power prop strike. Typically on low power prop strikes, we never find any damage in the engine. Um, high power prop strikes are, 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 are another issue. They can, they, they can cause some internal damage. So from a, First principles basis. If if you had a low power prop strike, uh, you know, I I wouldn't lose any sleep about not tearing down the engine. But the manufacturer recommends it. Insurance will pay for it. Um, so most people do it just because it's covered by insurance. Um, but if, for example, you were uninsured and it was coming out of your pocket, you, you might seriously consider not doing it if it was a low power prop strike because um, we almost we, we virtually never find any prop strike related issues and, and the other problem is if you tear down the engine after a prop strike even if you find no prop strike related issues you might find other issues that are going to make this thing expensive and you know it's, it's the pandora's box problem um, because the, the engine shop is not going to return the engine to you if anything is, uh, is outside of service limits, for example. They, they basically can't. Um, and, you know, your cylinders can be grotesquely out of service limits and still be working just dandy. But once you take the engine apart, you're compelled to measure it. And if it's, if it's outside of service limits, you can't put it back together. So we like to try to not take things apart unless we have to, because it opens Pandora's box. Matthew uh, wonders if you could comment on the statement, insurance companies don't like engines beyond TBO. Well, that's false. Insurance companies don't care about TBO. I I've talked about this before on, 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 on these webinars. You know, I. I have the 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 weird <laughs> distinction of, of having flown more hours over TBO than under TBO. Okay, and uh, and my insurance company has never asked a question about that. I've, I've been insured with several different underwriters over the course of the 55 years that I've been an aircraft owner, and no insurance company's ever questioned uh, being over TBO. That's just a totally totally a non-issue. Merrick wonders, wouldn't a pick getting caught in a lightly pitted cam indicate a failure? Uh, well, if you, if, you, if you follow the Continental Service Bullet and they, they say indentations or crack-like features that, that have a sufficient depth to be caught to, to catch the tip of a sharp pick. Now that the service bullet, and actually, uh, I was a little sad to see that because the, the predecessor service bullet, which was SID 05-1A, didn't say didn't have indentations in there. It said crack-like features, 
and um, then they reworded it in the B version, unfortunately, to, to say indentations or crack-like features. So that kind of broadened the scope of of uh, of what they considered to be disqualifying, which I thought was a little unfortunate, because I'm a you know I'm obviously a big fan of the let the cam vote <laughs> approach. I think that's a very reasonable approach since there's really no downside to doing it. But um, yeah, technically, if the pitting is deep enough um, to to repeatedly catch the tip of a sharp pick, and I, and also in the B version, I don't know why, but they added the word repeatedly. <laughs> it wasn't there in the A, but in the, in the B version, it's repeatedly catch the tip of a sharp pick, which I'm not sure why they did that. Um, then 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 that causes the cam to be considered unairworthy by that. Uh, you know, accordance with the continental guidance. Jerry wonders how many times can a crankcase be reused after overhauled? Um, quite a lot. Um, you know, basically at, at every overhaul, they take the two case halves and they they grind the the mating surface perfectly flat. And when they do that, they take a it takes a little bit of metal off of the parting surfaces so then they they bolt the crankcase halves together and all of the 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 holes where the where the main bearings are and where the camshaft runs and stuff um, have become slightly oval because they took a little bit of metal off the parting surface so then they do what's called line boring which is to bore those things back to be completely round so each time they do that, they take a little bit of metal off the case, and there is a, a specific limit as to how much metal you can take off the case before it it's not reusable. But it it can go through quite a quite a, a, a large number of reconditioning processes before before it uh, it, it doesn't pass the test. I, I don't know the absolute specifics, but I know it's quite a few times. Philip was wondering, um, in the situations you mentioned tonight, would the use of an oil additive such as CamGuard have mitigated production of detected metal? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of CamGuard. Um, I'm also a big fan of, of uh, using engine dehydrators if, if the engine is, is uh, has the little long periods of inactivity to uh, anything you can do to reduce the the possibility of, of corrosion uh, because the, the the pitting is is usually what starts this this process and it's a corrosion process and the pitting is basically caused by the airplane not being flown enough and and so the protective oil film uh, gradually strips off and exposes the camshaft to a corrosive attack also having a lot of moisture in the in the oil and unfortunately you know water is is one of the two main byproducts of combustion uh, the other being carbon dioxide and uh, the the water most of it goes out the exhaust in the form of steam when the engine is running but when you shut the engine down there's always a big slug of water that goes into the into the crankcase you know generated by the combustion and you know if you take the the oil cap off for example after you come in from a fly you see steam coming out of there and you see all kinds of water dripping from the cap that you just removed and that that moisture is is part of what's injurious to the cam. So um, a dehydrator to to purge moisture from the crankcase and the use of, uh, of, of an anti-corrosive additive like CamGuard, which I use religiously in my engines, is, uh, is, is a really good idea. Michael wonders if a mechanic finds spalled lifters and a damaged cam lobe, is an engine teardown quote unquote, always necessary. It happened to my T210 engine and the bill was 25K for engine removal, repair and replacement. Yeah, 
for sure. Um, well, again, you know, in, in, in the 210, the lifter, lifter replacement is trivial. Um, is if you have a you know a, a small lifter, you take it out, chuck it in the trash can, and put a new one in for a hundred bucks, not including the labor. But it's an easy, you know, it's a very easy task. And the real question is what the condition of the cam is. Most mechanics are are, are pretty spring loaded to say tear down the engine anytime they see damage to the cam. Um, and the point I was trying to get across and, and that a careful reading of the Continental Service Bulletin, I think gets across, is, is that the cam has to have significant damage to it um, be, before you can just look at it and say it's, it's unairworthy. And if it's a marginal case, the, the appropriate co course of action is to put a new lifter in there and then see what happens to it. Todd was wondering, is there a fogging oil that is available at the auto parts stores that we could use in a Lycoming engine? A fogging oil. Um, not sure what what that's referring to. Uh, is that is that? Is I think that he's thinking like about maybe letting it sit around for months at a time, like um, almost preserving the engine. Yeah, I don't I don't know what would be available at an auto parts store. Uh, I um, recommend using a, a a light penetrating oil that can be pumped in under uh, with a, with a with a pressure pot so that it's that, that it's it, it's put in as a very fine mist and it gets everywhere. And uh, something like aero coil or something like that uh, use or or one of the one of the the um, corrosion preventative things like corrosion x or acf50 actually is a is pretty good light penetrating oil it's very easy to fog and that that's that's what i would recommend we're we're, we're only trying to provide some pre-lube for the first you know 30 seconds after you start this engine um, uh, until until you start to get splash oil uh, on, on everything, it's it's you you just try and get uh, enough lubrication so that things don't don't squeak, uh, at, you know, initially right after engine start. William wonders, would there be any benefit on a Continental when doing push rod seals at annual to go ahead and replace the lifters? Any additional cam life? Well, I think I think it would be crazy not to pull the lifters and look at them. Uh, I mean, if you if if you're replacing the the pushrod housing seals, you've got all that stuff apart anyway, so you might as well pull the the lifter and take a peek at it. And if there's any damage at all to the lifter face, I I would I would change it. The the Continental Service Bulletin says, you know, up to 10% of the surface of the lifter may be spalled. I think that's nuts. If you, if, I mean, because lifters are cheap and cams are expensive, so uh, a lifter coming apart will eventually take out the cam, and you don't want that to happen. So, in my view, this is a little bit co contrary to Continental's guidance. Um, if if you see any uh, abnormalities on the face of the lifter, um, or any indication that the lifter is is not rotating and and in other words, the wear pattern on it is is not circular, but it's like it's supposed to be, but is somehow linear, meaning the lifter isn't isn't rotating the way it's supposed to be. Uh, I would change the lifter immediately. I, mean, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But certainly, anytime you're changing pushrod housing seals, you ought to take a peek at the lifter and see what it looks like, because it doesn't take but a minute. Andre wonders: Is the Lycoming additive LW? 16702, the same as CamGuard? No, it's not the same as CamGuard. Uh, 16702 is uh, is is an um, extreme pressure additive called tri triphenylphosphate. Uh, it is a um, it is not it has no anti corrosion properties whatsoever. It's strictly an ex extreme pressure additive, an anti scuff additive, if you will. Um, but it doesn't do anything. To protect the cam against corrosion, that's not what L, and and that 
uh, triphenyl phosphate it also is pre-blended into aerosol 100 plus or aerosol 15w50 those all have the same additive pre-blended in it as what as what comes in the lycoming can but that's strictly an anti-scuff additive it is not an anti-corrosion additive Merrick just wonders, could you repeat that Continental Service Bulletin for the CAM condition analysis again, please? Yes, it's, it's SID, uh, Service Information Directive, SID 05-1B. Uh, 1B is the latest version of it. Okay, Foster and, wonders your... Oh, I was going to say, and you can Google it, and uh, you can pick it right up off the, off the Continental site. Okay, Foster wonders your opinion on this. He says, my mechanic warns me I have an overhaul in the near future. I have an IO 470 with less than 500 hours since major. No visible corrosion, uh, all good compressions, but overhauled in 1984. New to me airplane, I've put over 150 hours on it with no metal on the filter and oil analysis haven't showed any red flags. It's stored in Eastern Oregon, very dry climate. Do you agree? Do I agree with the mechanic? Yeah. No, of course I don't. Of course I don't agree with the mechanic. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, saying it, he's saying this purely based on calendar time, I take it? It must be. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's just silly. Uh, and and uh, I would, if I if I had a mechanic that said that to me, um, before I would uh, allow him to do an annual inspection, I would say, look, you know, let's talk about this because if 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 you if if you're going to say I need to tear down the engine for the airplane to be airworthy, I'm going to take my business to somebody else for the annual inspection because I don't want to do that. If the engine's healthy, I don't want to keep flying it. Terry just makes a comment here. He says he flies behind a 165 horsepower Franklin engine. Ah. And uh, its design has a cover on top of the crankcase. Removing just 16 bolts allows one to remove this cover and inspect everything in the crankcase, cam, crank rods, etc. Has yeah. prevented him from doing major surgery on the engine more than once. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish all of our engines were built the way Franklin's were, or at least built with. You know, I've, I've always thought that it, it's such a crime that, that, that. Continental Lycoming don't at least, you know, provide some inspection ports where you can stick a borescope in and look at stuff. But uh, the Franklin is very nice in that regard. There's no question about it. Carol wonders, um, what would you do if you didn't find metal flakes in the filter, but the oil analysis revealed high copper readings? Um, I would, I would st stop using. Uh, the oil that you're using, <laughs> because it probably uh, it probably contains triphenyl phosphate, and triphenyl phosphate, which I, I don't I don't like that stuff by the way. That's why I, I prefer CamGuard. A triphenyl phosphate uh, can combine with water and uh, create phosphoric acid, which attacks uh, copper things and winds up creating a high. Uh, copper readings and oil analysis. So before I did anything else, if I had elevated copper readings and and, no, and the filter was clean, I, I would I would change to an oil that didn't have uh, triphenyl phosphate in it. Like the Philips product, uh, Philips 20W50, if you want a, a multi-grade oil or Aerochel W100 that doesn't have the plus on it, doesn't, doesn't have that stuff in it either. Monroe wonders, what about using microlon additive? Don't even think about it. M microlon is a is I didn't even know it's still on the market, <laughs> but my, microlon is a Teflon uh, uh, based additive. And uh, first of all, we've tested it thoroughly. It does nothing useful, but the problem is that uh, Teflon has the ability to. Uh, to to clog up um, hydraulic lifters, and uh, you you never want to use anything with Teflon uh, in your oil. Kevin even wonder du, even even Dupont Dupont who makes Teflon says do not do not use it as an oil additive. Hmm. 
Hmm. Kevin wonders, is it possible for the metal coming off the cam to get embedded in the main bearings or does the filter catch it all? The filter catches it all. Uh, Jerry just wonders, you stated uh, you could remove the oil filter tube on Lycomings to see part of the cam. Would that Mooney IO360 be one? It might. I uh, I have to confess that that I've never done that on a Lycoming. I, I, I swing wrenches and Connells a lot more. And um, but but we've we had a recent discussion with with my team and a bunch of them are Lycoming people and they say that they've they've pulled the oil filler uh, tube and it it provides um, bore scope access. So I'm just I'm just sort of repeating what what they've told me. I haven't actually done it myself. Mike says, we've been talking about part 91 operated certificated aircraft engines and that's well, but do you advise the same if it was an aircraft that operates under experimental rules? Uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I, I mean, I can't think of anything that I would do differently uh, on an experimental engine. Um, I mean, the, the stuff we were talking about with Lycoming and Continental uh, service bulletins, those are only service bulletins. Even for a Part 91 uh, operator, they're only service bulletins. They're only, they're only advisory. They're not compulsory. Um, I just think those two particular service bulletins that I mentioned, uh, you know, Lycoming 480F and Continental SID, whatever it was, <laughs> 05-1B, um, are, are very good service bulletins and provide, you know, very good uh, um, structure for guidance. And, and that that if you ask mechanics to follow those service bulletins to the letter, that, that will head off a lot of uh, kind of knee-jerk uh, teardown decisions because both of them provide, I, I think, you know, pretty reasonable guidance and, and it's good to follow. William wonders, uh, he says, Mike, I've watched every webinar you've produced many multiple times with notes. Nobody could possibly have done that. You know how many there are, right? <laughs> a lot, over 100. Uh, that said, do you offer a consultation service for a second opinion when needed? I've used your references many times to assist other owners also. Yeah, my, my company offers a, a, a consulting service called Savvy QA, um, and we have probably a thousand clients that, 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 uh, that we provide guidance to. So yeah, the answer is yes. Cool. James wonders, is using one quart of Marvel Mistral every oil change a good idea? No, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 not helpful. And Thomas wonders, does Exxon Elite have TPP? Um. It actually does, I believe, but uh, but it it was taken off the market a while back. So I mean, somebody has a secret stash of it somewhere, I guess. <laughs> but Exxon Exxon uh, uh, took a lead off the market a while back. It's no longer for sale. Mm -hmm. Oh, getting back to the uh, to the ball bearings, I guess, and the. Um... In the sump, Brian wonders, can you just stick a speaker magnet on the bottom of the oil pan? What's the purpose of this? I think maybe that's gonna, maybe the ball bearings then will just to hold, to hold the ball the bearings. In, is. I, yeah, I don't to know. hold the ball bearings in place for for inverted flight, is that the idea? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Yeah. You put a speaker magnet on the bottom of your oil sump. Nice. I think maybe, maybe, maybe you could use it if you had a flat oil sum, maybe you could use it to sort of guide the ball bearing system where where you could see them or whatever. Mm. Again, well, we should really talk about them as alleged ball bearings because we don't really know that there were ball bearings in his engine. Boy, that's maddening. All, that just, all we that... know, all we know is that they're missing. 
in action. Oh man, that mechanic had to just <laughs> really be losing sleep over that one. I know that would drive me crazy. Um, I get all the, I get all the good ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Mike, you recommend a bore scope in a previous webinar. Can you tell us again what's the good bore scope to get? Yeah, I, in fact, I just, I just, I just bought one. Um, the, the the bore scope is 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 the uh, the Vidia uh, VA400. It's a rigid bore scope with an articulating tip, and uh, th uh, there's something important about that. The, the Vidia has upgraded the um, the resolution of the VA400 twice now, and it's now full HD. It's like 1280 by nine something or other. It's it's a very high resolution camera. Wow. Um, I just I just purchased one, and I uh, because I had the old one that had a lower, lower resolution, about a quarter of the resolution, 640 by 480 or something, and I just purchased one directly from. Uh, from the manufacturer, Oasis Scientific, and you can buy it online. Um, and a colleague of mine just ordered one, just bought one off of Amazon. And we were comparing notes, and it turns out the one he bought off of Amazon was the old one with a low resolution. <laughs> so unfortunately, Vividia, when they when they improved the resolution of this bore scope, did not change the part number or put a suffix on it or something. So if you order a VA400, you don't know whether you're getting the, the latest and greatest one or you're getting the old one that has lower resolution. So I, I think the best bet, at least while this confusion is going on, is to order it directly from, uh, from, um, uh, from the manufacturer rather than to uh, buy it from a vendor off of Amazon or a craft tool service or stuff. So you know that you're getting the very latest one. There's a good tip there. All right, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence is wondering um, also where is the lab that did the metal analysis of the third engine in New York third example? Yes, it's Aviation Laboratories, uh, Avlab, A V L A B dot com, and it's located in Houston. And we we that's typically the place we send um, oil filter contents for uh, scanning electron microscope analysis, where they send back a a metallurgy report on it, basically. Um, we also sometimes will send a filter uh, to Blackstone Labs, which is the place we normally use for oil analysis. And they 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 don't have the equipment to determine a metallurgy, but they, they do have some very, very good optical microscopes and they send back really pretty microscope pictures of, if you're interested in the shape and, and appearance of, of the, metal that's in the filter, the Blackstone does a good job on that. But if you're if you're looking for determination of what the what the alloy is, then Avlab Aviation Laboratories is the place we send it. Hmm. Eric wonders, had a friend hit a taxiway light, no sudden stop, two propeller tips were bent, engine had 30 hours on a remand. Did this engine need a teardown? Well, it depends who you ask. Um, it, the, the chances are that, that there was absolutely no damage to the engine. It, it, it probably just needed two propeller blades replaced. Um, it depends on how bad the propeller blades were. It's conceivable they could have been straightened. I don't know how badly they were mangled. Um, but if you, if you if you ask Continental or Lycoming, they say, oh yeah, you should tear down the engine. Um, but are you going to find anything wrong in the engine? No, not for something like that. Not not if it was the, if, it, if it happened while he was at taxi power. Robert's wondering how is Mr. Bush doing on the Patreon book recording project? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I got I got the manifesto one done that was that was a, a fairly short book it's a 104 page book or something i'm working on the i'm working on the engines one but it it um it's it's a it's a really big project it's that that's the engine book it's over 500 pages long so um i i don't know for sure how soon that thing is going to be ready to go but it's 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 the one that i'm working on now and uh, 
Bryant just typed in here. Um, for superior advice about aircraft engines, I suggest that listeners acquire a copy of Mike Bush's book titled Mike Bush on Engines. It's an excellent read and it's available from the EAA store. The check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, uh, looks like we're kind of getting to the end here. Um, and we had, um, I, I think, about 800 people logged in tonight. So just a oh, great cool. turnout and a beautiful set of questions. Thank you, everybody, for all the questions. Um, take a moment, Mike, and kind of share your closing thoughts with all of us. OK, uh, well, um, just quickly to, to uh, if, if you're not on my email list for uh, we send out uh, weekly maintenance stories uh, and um, a monthly newsletter, um, all the maintenance related stuff. If you if you're not on the email list and you want to get on the email list, the easiest way to get on is to is to pull out your smartphone and and text the word savvy s a v v y to three three seven seven seven, and it'll ask you for your email address and your first name and your last name and it'll put you on the list. Um, you can act, you can also go to the website savvyaviation.com and and click the the um, newsletter button and it will let you sign up that way. Um, but I think uh, using the smartphone uh, mail bot is the easiest way to get on the list. Um, you know the the books are available. Uh, from Amazon, Manifesto is also available in, in an audio version, and I'm working on the audio version of Engines. But uh, you, you, you can see the, the relative thickness of the books in, in this slide, and Engines is a, is a, is a big book. Um, every month, uh, I do a, a podcast called Ask the AMPs with my colleagues, uh, Paul New and Colleen Sterling. And um, it's a, it's a, it's basically a call-in show where we and where, where we deal with uh, with aircraft owners' uh, questions, and it's kind of patterned after the old uh, car talk program on uh, on NPR, and uh, that comes out the first of every month. So the latest issue, just the latest edition of the podcast, uh, just just came out um, yesterday. Uh, we we typically record each version in the middle of the month and then we take a couple of weeks to edit it and, and, and put it up so and if you have any questions uh, that you would like to if you'd like to participate in this podcast and, and be one of the callers and stuff um, uh, email uh, to podcast at aopa.org and our producer Ian Twombly will will, will get you lined up uh, for the for the next recording session and and finally, the next uh, the next three webinars that I'm doing these are always first Wednesday of every month. Um, the next one in April, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the thing that we that we provide called a report card, which is kind of interesting. You upload engine monitor data to to our platform, and um, it will compare. Uh, various um, operating parameters of, from your aircraft to all of the other aircraft with the same of the same make and model that we follow and uh, and let you know how you're doing relative to other people and various parameters that affect efficiency and um, uh, longevity of the engine and and, and so on um, that's kind of interesting so in the april webinar i'm going to be going through a a report card for a specific series so you can see what it looks like and then we'll talk about you know what actionable intelligence comes out of the report card in terms of uh, things that you should do either maintenance wise or operation wise um in may i'm i'm going to be doing a podcast a, a webinar called tulip fever it's it's about it's about pre-buys and the importance of doing pre-buys we, I call it tulip fever because we've got this crazy market going on right now where it's a it's a seller's market airplanes are uh, prices are being bid up real high and airplanes are uh, are turning over very very fast and so buyers uh, are frequently s skipping some of the due diligence that they really ought to do before they buy an airplane and so I'll be talking about about that in the May webinar 
And finally, in June, um, the webinar is titled Failure to Rotate. We're going to be talking about burned exhaust valves and the reason that they burn. And uh, we've been seeing a lot of rotocoil uh, failures uh, that are leading to burn valves. And uh, talk about how to, how to detect those and, and correct them before the valve gets burned enough that the cylinder is going to have to come off. We can uh, save a lot of cylinders that way by, by paying attention. So the, that's the next three webinars, and uh, I think that's about all, all I have. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for an excellent presentation, as always, and looking forward to April's presentation on the 6th. Uh, so thank you so much, and to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you all for joining us, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you.